Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's event, uh, Columbia at Home, Prospects for US-China Relations in the Biden Era. My name is Eugenia Lean. I am a professor of history in the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department at Columbia University. And I'm also the director of the Weatherhead East Asia Institute. Today, I will be serving as a moderator for uh, a wonderful panel uh, that I hope uh, you will all enjoy. Uh, given the current uh, climate of uh, tense relationships between China and the US, uh, we thought that this would be a very timely panel to examine uh, how US-China relations will evolve with President Biden uh, now at the helm of uh, the United States. Uh, we uh, hope too that uh, the panel will address uh, sort of uh, as we leave the post-COVID, the COVID era, hopefully, um, that it will also address sort of the impact of um, COVID and now post-COVID on these particular relationships. Um, so we have a, an esteemed panel, array of professors on this panel. Um, and uh, I would like to spend some time just quickly introducing them. Uh, before I do, I also want to just mention that uh, the program itself is co-sponsored by the uh, CAA Global Clubs, and I wanted to thank them for initiating the uh, panel, uh, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute as well, and the Columbia, Harvard, China, and the World Program. Our panelists include uh, the following. Tom Christensen is the Professor of Public and International Affairs and the Director of the China and the World Program at Columbia University. His research and teaching focus on China's foreign relations, the international relations of East Asia and international security. His most recent book is The China Challenge, Shaping the Choices of a Rising Power. Chen Gao is a professor of social policy and social work She's the founding director of Columbia University's China Center for Social Policy. Her research examines the changing nature of the Chinese welfare system, its impact on poverty and inequality, China's uh, social protection for rural to urban migrants, migrants uh, in China and in Asian uh, American immigrants. Her book, recent book is Welfare, Work and Poverty, Social Assistance in China. Uh, Xiaobo Lu is the Anne Whitney Olin Professor of Political Science at Barnard College. He is the founding director of uh, Columbia Global Centers in Beijing. His research interests include Chinese politics, US-China relations, politics of economic development, corruption and good governance, and government business relations. He's currently working on a book manuscript, From Player to Referee, The Rise of a Regulatory State in China. Our fourth speaker is Andrew Nathan, class of 1919 professor of political science at Columbia University. His research interests include Chinese politics foreign, and foreign policy, the comparative study of political participation in political culture and human rights. Uh, he is engaged in long-term research and writing on China, Chinese foreign policy uh, and sources of political legitimacy in Asia. And finally, but certainly not least, Professor Benjamin Liebman. He is the Robert L. Leaf Professor of Law at the Columbia Law School and Director of the Hong Yin Chang, Chang Center for the Chinese Legal Studies. Uh, Professor Liebman studies Chinese court judgments, the roles of artificial intelligence and big data in the Chinese legal system. He studies Chinese tort law, Chinese criminal procedure and the evolution of China's courts. Uh, so we have, uh, an impressive array of experts who will be speaking to the topic at hand. Uh, I will now uh, welcome our first speaker, uh, Professor Thomas Christensen. Thanks a lot, Eugenia. Um, I wanted to talk about US policy uh, in the Biden administration, how it's likely to play out in US-China relations. And at the start, I'll just say that a lot of the economic tensions uh, security concerns about Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea with Japan, and humanitarian concerns related to Xinjiang and Hong Kong uh, democracy suppression are going to last into the, into the current administration. They're not purely a uh, function of the Trump administration, uh, but I think some of the strategies will be different. 
Uh, some of the good news is that the uh, pe people involved in policy making are highly experienced, people like Kurt Campbell, uh, Laura Rosenberger, Dan Crittenbrink, the latter two I worked with at the State Department when I was in the government, uh, they're highly talented people. I think their strategy will be a competitive strategy with China uh, that will continue, but it'll be a different approach that places more emphasis on uh, emphasizing the U.S.'s greatest advantage in a competition with China, which is alliances and partners. Um, the United States will try to approach China on economic issues, on humanitarian issues, and on security issues, shoulder to shoulder with its allies and partners. Uh, and to do that, they need to rebuild those relationships, many of which were damaged during the Trump administration because of pressure on our allies over trade and pressure on our allies over burden sharing within the alliance system. So that seems like a good approach and it should be relatively successful early on uh, repairing those, those relationships. A problem that I see is that uh, part of a alliance-based uh, strategy towards China requires an economic strategy towards East Asia. And um, I'm not clear that the United States uh, as a corporate whole or the Biden administration is really ready to embrace the kind of multilateral trade agreements that would strengthen the US position in the region. Uh, there is the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that the United States unilaterally pulled out of um, in the Trump administration. Uh, there is the RCEP, which is the regional agreement that was signed last year by 40 countries. Um, and the problem that I see here is the Biden administration does not seem particularly enamored uh, with multilateral economic diplomacy. It seems relatively protectionist, and that reflects a relatively protectionist turn in American domestic politics more generally. And I think it's going to be hard to have an alliance-based strategy toward China without an economic component. And we'll see how that plays out over time. Um, there's also a need for cooperation. And I think the Biden administration recognizes this more than the Trump administration. We live in a globalized world, um, despite US protectionism uh, in the economic sphere. We can't handle a whole range of global issues without China's buy-in and China's participation. Uh, that includes climate change, most obviously, uh, dealing with the pandemic, both directly and indirectly in the financial uh, 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 area around the world. Also, nuclear proliferation. Uh, everyone knows that China is the biggest partner of North Korea, uh, a proliferator, but a lot of people don't realize that China is by far the biggest economic partner of Iran. So those issues are going to be pressing, and you just simply can't leave China out of any kind of uh, approach to those areas when China has such a big footprint. Um, so how, how the Biden administration will deal with those issues is going to be an interesting thing to watch. And one of the hopeful signs is that the Biden administration seems more uh, comfortable with multilateralism uh, than the Trump administration, which tried to handle problems bilaterally. This is useful because the domestic environment in the United States toward China is so hostile that it's difficult to cooperate with China bilaterally on the issues that I listed. It should be easier to cooperate with China in large groupings, multilateral settings. Uh, it'll have less of a domestic backlash of, uh, if, if the United States pursues cooperation with China through the WHO, the World Health Organization, the World Food Program, uh, the WTO, uh, the IMF World Bank, the P5 plus one on Iran nuclear uh, negotiations, and maybe even uh, the six-party talks again, which have been dormant for a long time on North Korea. Um, so that embracing of, of multilateralism is a big advantage of the Biden administration. And then there's one last thing I wanna mention before I sign off. And that is uh, that we have a kind of a train wreck uh, heading in US-China relations in early 2022. And that is the Winter Olympics uh, that Beijing is hosting. Um, because of the human rights abuses in Xinjiang, a lot of countries are pressuring China on human rights issues right now, not just the United States. And the fact that the US has labeled what's happening in Xinjiang a genocide um, will make it uh, very difficult to defend the idea that uh, a US team should attend the Olympics. And that might be true in other countries. The backlash in China to a boycott of the Olympics will be very strong because of the history of Chinese nationalism and the, uh, the notion that China has been bullied through history. So I, I, I see this as a, as a real problem in the future. I don't know how it's gonna play out, uh, but I don't really see a lot of uh, 
I, I see a lot of potential problems in the bilateral relationship that will flow from domestic pressure on the US government and on the US Olympic Committee uh, regarding the Olympics. And I'll turn it over back to Eugenia. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, our next speaker is Professor Chin Gao Chin. Thank you so much, Eugenia, and thank you all for joining this discussion today. As a proud alum myself, I'm happy to reuni reunite with the, my peer alums from around the world, especially from Asia. So I want to shift the discussion a bit to highlight three areas where I think US, the US and China should work together, both as collaborators and competitors in the years uh, ahead. The first area is anti-poverty economic and social policy. The second area is public health. And the third area is education. I'll start from the anti-poverty policy area. So last year, um, toward the end of the year, China proudly declared uh, winning the war of poverty. In fact, eradicating rural extreme poverty uh, it was on November 23rd, uh, the announcement was made. It's a remarkable achievement, very proud uh, to, to own this achievement by the current Chinese administration. Uh, but I think they also acknowledge poverty is not entirely gone. Poverty exists in other relatives or relative or dynamic forms. And there are different pockets of people in the society that still face more challenges than others. On the other hand, at the same time, the Biden administration just passed this 1.9 trillion American rescue plan, which is probably the most ambitious, most sweeping anti-poverty agenda since both the New Deal and the war on poverty in the US. Um, so that's very promising. And the Biden administration especially has child poverty as a focus. So they are going to pursue child allowances, child tax credit, and also support parents to work uh, by uh, launching uh, early, child, early childhood care centers. So those are amazing. And there I see uh, the two countries are already learning from each other. Uh, for example, the Biden administration is pursuing infrastructure investment, which is a lesson from the New Deal, New Deal and the war of poverty eras in the US, but also a lesson from China's recent su successes in this regard. Um, China is also now pursuing a lot of rural village early childhood care centers. And that is actually a lesson from uh, the US's uh, Head Start programs launched in the 1960s. So I think the two countries are looking at each other to see who can do this faster and better and in what ways. So I think that's an area where there should be some dialogue and joint efforts, uh, both as competitors, but also as collaborators. The second area I want to touch upon is public health. Uh, honestly, I think COVID is a missed opportunity for these two countries to work together. Uh, can we all imagine what if the two countries worked together to deal with the pandemic? I think the world would be at a different place. So I think that should be a lesson learned by everyone, the leaders of these two countries. I think we see promising signs uh, in that regard, but uh, I think we should also realize it's not easy and uh, a concerted effort should be made. In the US, uh, Biden was in the Obama administration when Ebola outbreak happened. And I think that handling was much more successful than uh, dealing with COVID. So lessons there uh, for sure. Uh, the other major consequence of the COVID pandemic is the global mental health crisis. I think we are all feeling it. Adults, children, adolescents, everybody is under so much pressure, anxiety, the lack of control about the future, so many uncertainties. There, I see a greater need for the two countries to work together to deal with and provide support and interventions uh, that are effective to support uh, our two populations and jointly uh, as uh, Chinese American who now uh, live in the US, but also have to 
communicate and deal with the health consequences for my family in China, I think we face this shared challenge and that can be only dealt with uh, collect, uh, in, in collaboration. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about education. I think today, all our panelists and uh, many in the audience are beneficiaries of collaboration exchange uh, in the education area, especially in higher education, but maybe in elementary, middle school education as well. Um, and, and some uh, doing postdocs and further research. Um, I think to pursue a future that's good for everyone, we need the future leaders that can benefit from this continued exchange and collaboration and from the education systems that suit the people who decide what's the best for them. So I would urge the two countries to continue that tradition and uh, um, not let the artificial barriers stop us from working together and really to promote the human potential from both countries and from around the world. I will stop there and look forward to more discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chin. Uh, for our third uh, panelist, uh, Xiaobo Liu will take the helm and, and uh, uh, give us a five to six minute presentation on his thoughts. Thank you very much, Eugenia. Thank you. Um, uh, colleagues and alumni around the world. It's a great honor to talk to you this way. Although um, I, I'd love to, uh, I would have loved to uh, see you, in, you know, face to face. But uh, in the pandemic, that's the best way to to reach out to you. Um, so as Tom and Chin has uh, has have uh, 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 remarked that uh, this U.S.-China relations is in. A, rather difficult time, but uh, so everyone is curious what Biden administration will do next in terms of this relationship. It seems to me as observer of this relationship for many years that the principal strategy of Biden administration regarding this relationship have emerged as what I would call three C plus. I think Tom has, uh, has alluded to it. Um, that is competition, uh, cooperation, and counter. That's the three C, you know, competition. Uh, competition, obviously, that's a term being used quite often. Cooperation, obviously, has been there for a long time in this relationship, but also counter. That is in areas where in t uh, when it comes to human rights violations and other, uh, other uh, uh, issues that, uh, principal issues that US obviously will push back. Now, the plus, the, not the C, or one could say the fourth C is with company. So that makes the, the, the difference between uh, Biden administration and its predecessors, the Trump administration. That is, you know, to do this not alone, rather as, as a group or with allies. Because as Tom alluded to, and I completely agree that uh, this will also uh, lessen the, uh, the kind of domestic burden or domestic pressure that uh, Biden administration faces right now. And uh, so I think in the US-China relations, one of the key factors, which I will you know, uh, focus my next couple of minutes on is these, what I call the people's factor or the public opinion, the domestic pressure, what, what Tom Christian to allude to. And if I may, I would like to share the screen with you. Uh, give you a couple of, uh, show you a couple of um, uh, slides here. Um, so this is the most, re uh, this is a, a, a survey, Pew Research Survey done last uh, October. And what this is interesting is that you can see that some of the major powers in the world, when they ask people of this countries uh, what they think of China. So the blue line is the positive. So please take a look at a couple of countries. One is Australia. So Australia, the, the change is the most striking is Australia's public opinion on China. This is the favorable, uh, unfavorable opinion. And you also can see this is where United States so U.S., even though it's not as, as bad as in Australia currently, it, is, uh, it has to be the worst public opinion, I guess the, the, uh, the worst public opinion regarding China in the last 40 years. Uh, so this is uh, you know 73% of uh, American public regard China more negatively. 
And that even, you so if you can also compare with Japan, here's Japan, where Japan, interestingly, even though it is, it's pretty, the negativity, negative opinion is high, but it hasn't changed that much. It actually was down before, and this is bad. And Italy obviously has the more, more this is the public opinion. You can see that, uh, of course, different countries, the public opinion uh, obviously uh, 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 has changed, worsened, all worsened in the last year or so uh, with the pandemic going on. Now, this is a, a, a more recent survey by Pew in February, uh, this, this uh, uh, February, and uh, this is asked specifically what kind of issues that people's concern and how they view. What's interesting is even though some of the issues really has not changed that much, but US public opinion has worsened in one year. So it's interesting how you know, cyber attack, for example, that hasn't really, we haven't really in the last year or so, there hasn't been much of that report uh, uh, of cyber attack from China yet. That, that has uh, risen 7% China's po uh, policy on human rights. That's not a surprise. Lost jobs to China, growing military power. So every, almost in every single issue area, except Taiwan, that uh, has worsened even in, in one year. Now, this is also very interesting. Who are the people? How people, when, when people when they say, okay, the domestic pressure, where did that come from? So also this uh, uh, the survey asked people distinguish between three different kind of um, uh, 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 sort of a China status or a view of China. One is partner, obviously it's very few people. And then the other distinction, which I think Pew was the first time to, to separate the two, which is in line with this, uh, you know, uh, uh, Biden administration's kind of view of China in the future as competitor or enemy, right? So either the uh, competition or counter, if you will. And that also very interestingly, the conservative Republicans obviously has the highest uh, uh, take on China as enemy. Whereas in relative terms, the others mostly regard China as competitor. So the, among the bad news, and this is uh, too bad, right? If you, if you look at China as, as being taken as a competitor, obviously that's a lot better. Now, what about the other side? So let me give you a couple of uh, a very interesting survey on China uh, 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 by the Chinese uh, newspaper media, the Global Times. Uh, some of you may know who this uh, paper is, which is very much uh, official, but is very populist and nationalist kind of uh, uh, media. But it did a survey, which I, when I read the result, I actually thought it was quite reflective of the current uh, 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 sort of a, a, a feelings or the reaction, uh, uh, opinions of Chinese regarding the United States and US-China relations. So some are surprised, some are not surprising. For example, the US-China relations still regarded as, as the most important by far than the other international relations. So still Chinese regard this relationship as very important. That's that's a somewhat a surprise, but not completely. But this one is very interesting. I think it should be taken very seriously. If you look at uh, uh, how, China, how where the when they ask how whether this new Cold War between China and the U.S. is likely, and 23.7%, roughly 24% total, see not likely or less likely. But you see so many about 40% think it is very likely or. Uh, inevitable already began. This is the, actually the language were quite strong in that sense, right? So, and also the second charts and this the, on this slides also say, do you agree China strength versus United States competition has grown significantly? That is very important change, say from several number of years ago, right? We don't have a more recent survey because this is, isn't down very regularly like Pew in the United States. So this is a rare window through which we're looking into this sort of a Chinese, uh, you know, a public kind of opinion of China, how this, how they regard themselves. So self-confidence has risen quite dramatically. And that, you know, a lot of people feel China in this competition, China at least that, you know, predominantly feel that is in, in a stronger position, if you will. Now, this chart also is, is very important, uh, I think, to, for us to, 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 to understand, for you to know, is that when it asks where a new Biden administration eased tension with, in China-US relations, 
you know, about it's a mixed opinion, right? Uh, some say yes, some say no, some say don't know. So a lot of people still don't know whether it would, uh, would be increased. And then you have this very last question was quite interesting. This is, uh, this is uh, from the survey. And the survey asked about whether the wolf warrior, this kind of a, you know, tough, hawkish uh, diplomacy posture by China is, you know, how they agree with that. 71% say this is the diplomatic attitude should take, 71%. So that's obviously give you a sense of how China today is, you know, a lot of Chinese, uh, you know, public opinion. And I think it's it's really, to some extent, even though it's done by Chinese media, it does reflect what uh, a lot of Chinese, uh, folk, uh, Chinese people uh, regarding their relationship with the United States and their, themselves. So let me finally say that, so this indicates that Ch Biden administration has a short-term and long-term challenge. Short-term challenge is how to and disentangle and um, this, this really massive relationship right now. We're in a stalemate. Even after the Anchorage meeting by the foreign, minister, foreign ministers, and it seems that there's no concrete move by neither side to, to, uh, to sort of thaw this current frozen stage of uh, relationship. And a number of things that, that the Biden administration probably or you, you, with China together could do, for example, visa, you know, now is, is a practical frozen of visa. There's international travel as the pandemic uh, 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 situation uh, uh, improves. And, uh, and also uh, there are a number of other things that probably that uh, Biden administration could do in short term. But long term, let me end with this note. And long term, I see a lot of very challenging uh, for Biden administration. And that is to how to gain the trust and respect of Chinese, you know, because this is a, a very challenging and how to really also, lead, you know, lead the, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, facing the domestic pressure, the public opinion on the United States, in the United States, to improve the relationship with China. And that's, I think, is, is a very challenging, and, uh, and I'll end it there, in here and turn to, uh, to Eugenia. Thank you so much, Shabwa. Uh, our fourth speaker is uh, Andrew Nathan. Andy? Hi, um, I'm thrilled to see my colleagues. I haven't seen them in over a year and I'm very happy to be meeting this way with the alumni. I'm gonna present a sort of guardedly pessimistic view of the relationship. The US-China relationship, I think, changed in a fundamental way under Trump uh, from one that looked for cooperation and was optimistic to one that was antagonistic. There were some political causes for this, particularly some of the members of the Trump administration, I'll give the example of Mike Pompeo, wanted to demonize China for their domestic political aspirations, but, but the real causes were much deeper and those are structural. They are the change in the power balance between China and the United States, the rise of China. And as China has risen and is richer and has can invest in more military capabilities and diplomatic capabilities. It has wanted to improve its security situation. And the United States has for a long time been the chief threat to Chinese security. So China wants to improve its situation and the United States feels threatened by that. Even so, the change from Trump to Biden has brought in some big shifts in American policy First of all, the Biden administration's policy is, is going to be is already much more strategic there. Trump's administration was divided and Trump himself had no long term strategic vision. Biden's administration is going to be disciplined and, as Tom said, has experts making policy and they think strategically. And the first element of that strategy is to restore America's relationships with its allies and to, to try to develop a common approach, uh, not to destroying China or to containing China, but to try to shape, to borrow the uh, title of Tom Christensen's recent book, Shape Chinese Behavior, 
A second element of the Biden strategy is rebuilding the United States because at the core of this uh, strategic competition between China and the United States is the power balance and the United States has been declining in power, declining in will, declining in political um, determination and clarity, declining in soft power. And so we really can't compete effectively with China without rebuilding those things. A fourth element of the Biden policy is going to be a consistent emphasis on human rights. And I think there are three reasons for that. One is an actual commitment on the part of, uh, of the members of the administration to the uh, integrity of the international human rights norms. But a second one is political, which is to frame the US-China competition as a clash of systems, as Biden said recently, we have to show whether democracy works or authoritarianism works. And that means not only with respect to how individuals are treated, but that the, the two economic models are seen as one is rule of law, one is not the military strategy, one is seen as obeying international law and the other one is not. So framing the competition in these principled terms to explain to the public, this again is a theme of an earlier book of Tom Christensen, uh, to, to explain to the American public why we're engaged in something that's, you know, 10,000 miles away, Asia, you have to say, well, it's all about the clash of systems. And the third reason for emphasizing human rights is that it's perceived as a weak point of China in the competition because of their, um, violations of human rights in so many ways. And then the, the final aspect, I think, of the Biden policy that's different from the Trump policy would be to hope to be able to find some areas of cooperation, as all of the three speakers before me have mentioned. In this context of competition, and, and as Xiaobo showed, you know, rising antagonism against China, it's important to understand the quote unquote China threat as accurately as we can. How big is this threat? I think it's definitely quite serious, particularly around Taiwan, uh, where China has very strong resolution and good reasons why they want to exert control over Taiwan. And the United States has very strong reasons why it wants to continue to insist on what U.S. policy calls peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue, which looks like means permanent separation of Taiwan from mainland China. I think uh, uh, the, the competition over, these, over this issue is going to be continuous and very, very intense. And there, there is the risk of military clash emerging out of that competition and the implications of the competition over Taiwan for the US position in Asia, the power balance in Asia, Japan, Korea, the Southeast Asian countries are very important. The other very, very real part of the so-called China threat is who's gonna dominate the 21st century economy because that will decide which economy grows faster and has more access and sets standards and so forth. On the other hand, I think we shouldn't think of the US-China competition as a, an existential threat to you know, American autonomy or our control over our own system. China is not a revolutionary power. It doesn't have an ideological ambition to impose Chinese-style rule over the whole world. It's not the Soviet Union. The comp confrontation between the two sides in a military sense is at sea in the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, the Western Pacific, not on land as it was in the old Cold War. And as Chin Gao and others have said, unlike the old Cold War, there really is a cooperation imperative for things like global public health, for things like climate change and other issues, North Korea, Iran, uh, as Chin Gao said, uh, education, social welfare, poverty elimination, and so forth. However, and this would be my final point, that although there is a cooperation imperative, at the 
level of the ivory tower or the 30,000 feet level, we can see this imperative, but when one begins to dig into the modalities of cooperation, it, the de devil is in the details and it quickly turns out that within cooperation, there is still competition. So to take the example of climate change, there is the question of which country will dominate the new technologies that are necessary to alleviate climate change. Who's going to control solar panels? Who's going to control uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, hydro not batteries, but hydrogen power systems? Who's going to control uh, these technologies? Because that country will benefit. So, um, and and who will invest how much in? alleviating climate change and in every area of competition of cooperation you have these elements of competition and fine a final obstacle to competition is distrust i think chin gao mentioned it or xiaobo mentioned it but the trouble about mutual distrust is that it is well founded it isn't something you could just wish away uh, China, for example, has violated their WTO commitments. The United States, for example, has violated its commitment to the Iran nuclear deal and so forth. In fact, the two countries realistically cannot entirely trust each other. And so it's not something that we can uh, fix by just saying we need to trust each other. Um, international politics is very cruel and it's really founded on mistrust. And so it's not going to be easy to uh, find a, a way forward toward the cooperation that we all need. Thank you very much. And back to Eugenia. Thank you, Andy. Uh, our last speaker is Professor Ben Liebman. Uh, ben. Great. Uh, thanks for, for having me. Uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. It's great to see such a great turnout. So I guess one of the benefits of, of going last is I just get to say I agree. Uh, but um, so maybe I'll just try and, and highlight a few issues that uh, haven't come up or developed them a little bit more. Um, but I, I generally agree with the tone of this conversation so far. You know, I, I like to say I think the Biden administration is going to be smarter, not softer, much more emphasis on alliances. But I don't expect you know, major changes with regard to China. I also think it's important to emphasize, I mean, we frame this discussion as US-China relations under Biden, which I think implies that you know, improving relations somehow falls more on the Washington side of things than on the Beijing side of things. And I just think it's important to recognize that this really stark deterioration we've seen in the last few years has roots both in Washington and, and in Beijing. There have been big political changes in both countries over the last four to eight or nine years. Um, and, and those have together contributed to the downturn in relations. So, so looking forward also, you know, we need to look at, 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 at how things are changing both in Washington and in Beijing, as we think about how at least to stabilize if not improve the relationship, um, which is another way of saying that any, you know, any shifts uh, need to be reciprocal, right? Both in substance and in tone, there needs to be some interest on both sides in having a more stable relationship. And I'll say, you know, I, I guess I'd say we're only three months in. Um, there are some sort of smaller things I, I would have liked to see happen, uh, but I was sort of watching to see, are we gonna see some positive steps early on, uh, especially coming out of the Anchorage meetings? Um, I had hoped there might be a few more positive steps. I think there are things that both sides could do to, to sort of show goodwill. On the US side, I think clearly, Ending the travel ban, in particular on Chinese students, would be an important step in terms of building goodwill. There's, I don't think there's a public health justification right now for the travel ban on China, given the low COVID rates in China and the, the openness of the US to travel from many other countries where things are much worse. On the Chinese side, I think it's clear right, that, that the major step China could take that is, would be a sign of goodwill would be to free the two Canadian Michaels, including Columbia graduate uh, Michael Kovrig, who's now been in prison for more than two years. But the signs aren't good, right? The fact that we haven't seen progress in either of those issues, I don't think is, is you know, is, is not a great sign in, in my view. I, I really had hoped we'd see, see some progress on this. All right, so in just the last couple of minutes, um, I guess what I wanna do is highlight a few issues uh, that, that maybe we haven't touched on too much yet. Uh, maybe one we have, a couple we haven't. Um, 
One is, I, I think it's really important to, and, and interesting and worrisome to watch the sort of escalating cycle of, of sanctions. I, I call this the sort of reciprocal lawfare that we're now seeing, the cycle of sanctions and counter sanctions from the US, uh, Europe as well, um, our allies and, and from China. Uh, also much more assertive use by China to use its legal system to target critics outside of China, including academics. Uh, I think this is a new and worrying trend. Um, and I'll say, I don't actually think that all of the US sanctions have been particularly productive or helpful. You know, the recent sanctions against senior National People's Congress officials, including a lot of legal folks, um, I, I don't quite understand what they were, were trying to achieve. And then we've seen the response from China of sanctioning academics, um, think tanks uh, around the world. Uh, I just think this is something to watch and, and, and it's gonna, you know, if this continues, if things, things are gonna probably continue to get worse rather than getting better. Um, I think it is worth noting that the US at least believes that it is sanctioning conduct while China is sanctioning speech. But I think this is just an important issue to watch and it's something that's developed pretty rapidly over the last year or so. Uh, second, I just want to say a word about travel and visas. Uh, obviously, we all here at Columbia hope that travel can resume, uh, in particular, so that many of our students now in China can, can return. Uh, I guess, you know, I don't have any great inside information, but, you know, my best guess is that nothing is going to change anytime soon. Uh, and uh, that's because I think almost certainly any resumption of travel is going to be through reciprocal agreement, right? The US is gonna to have to lift its travel ban on China, but China is gonna to have to also start letting uh, non-Chinese nationals in with, with, with some greater degree of ease than exists right now. And I just don't see that happening within the next few months and probably not happening even, I wonder if it'll even happen before the Olympics given concerns within China uh, and also vaccine rates within China uh, heading, up to, heading up to the Olympics. And then on, on cooperation, you know, I agree with everything that's been said that, that we need to find areas of cooperation, climate change, uh, public health, um, uh, you know, related issues. It's, it's worrying to me to watch the sort of reciprocal questioning of vaccines that's, that's happened on both sides, uh, spreading of, of disinformation in some cases about vaccines outside of China. Uh, you know, I, I think it's clear, I think almost, I'm sure most people on this call would agree, you know, the world needs all of the vaccines to work, Chinese vaccines, the American vaccines, whatever, German vaccines. Um, and, and just the fact that we're still locked in this, this cycle of mutual questioning about things so fundamental as vaccines is, is, I don't think it's good for anyone. So, you know, my hope is that there can be ways in which, you know, the, the if not government, at least, at least you know, academia, medical science can, can strengthen ties and cooperation at this incredibly vital moment. And, and I'll just close by, close by saying, I think, you know, what does this all mean for us at Columbia? Uh, I think in, in a time of, of really worsening US-China relations, the need for engagement by universities remains extremely strong, right? That, that we need to be having the conversations on a range of issues that maybe, you know, folks in Washington and Beijing are finding it harder to have. Um, so, so, you know, I think all of us look forward to opportunities to engage with our Chinese colleagues more going forward and to having students back and travel going on. I think this is going to get only more important going forward. I also just want to say uh, that there, we're really fortunate at Columbia to have a really outstanding team at the Beijing, at the Global Center in Beijing, and they've just done an extraordinary, uh, eff, extraordinary job over the past year of keeping events going out of the center in Beijing at a time in which, you know, none of us can travel to China and, and folks from China can't travel here. So I just want to say thank you to them. And, you know, we look forward to more events working with them over the, the coming period and hopefully to doing it, uh, doing some of these events in person as well. So I'm all set. Thank you, Ben. I think at this point, I might uh, raise a few questions to generate a little bit of a discussion uh, among panelists and um, hopefully for the next 15 or 20 minutes. And then I will open up uh, the, uh, to a live Q&A session. We're already getting a whole host of questions in the Q&A box. Um, so, uh, so thank you all. Um, this, uh, many of you shared, I think, uh, a, a view, I think Andy put it sort of 
guarded pessimism, um, although we all want to remain hopeful uh, about the current relations. Um, and uh, I wanted to perhaps just start with uh, Ben's point that perhaps the university is in a good position, given the fact that politicians are in this ever kind of, you know, war of escalation, you know, kind of constant back and forth. The Anchorage uh, meeting was certainly one where uh, it was a bit dismaying, um, no indication that there was going to be an immediate pr pr improvement or thaw um, in terms of the relationships uh, that some had hoped would be the case with the new Biden administration. Um, and then of course, on the ground in the United States, there is uh, growing anti-Asian violence um, and uh, um, fomenting, uh, you know, fomented initially from some of the uh, sort of aggressive stances taken by those who were in power originally due to the COVID situation, but that are kind of also had long been brewing because of the structural, right? And you talked about, you know, these are relationships, the tensions have been brewing beyond just the Trump administration's more, you know, anti-China stance. Um, so, so, so the question is, you know, how do we be hopeful? <laughs> And how do we go forward? Um, and many of you have suggested in certain ways. Ben's um, point about academia being a possible place for collaboration is um, one that is, and especially as we are all part of the university, is, is one that is perhaps a sensible one. But at the same time, Ben, your presentation is one that suggests that there's still serious obstacles, right? I mean, the visa ban, I mean, one way that we collaborate so deeply is by bringing students over here and by having our students and faculty go to China and working with Chinese colleagues. Chin Gao was talking about all these possible points of um, soft, uh, sort of soft diplomacy. Um, but when you have uh, these literal obstacles, such as the ban on, on travel, and the targeting of academics, both by the Chinese government, but I will say also our own government, right? One of the things that we've been witnessing uh, on campus is Chinese scientists, uh, not just on our campus actually, but you know MIT and so on and so forth being targeted um, for uh, you know purported espionage, right? Um, so 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 any um, you know how do we even in this kind of more sort of focused space, which might seem a little bit more hopeful than the political arena where, where both governments are, are, are dealing with um, escalating internal and domestic pressure, as Xiaobo was pointing to in China, but many of you have also pointed to the public pressure from, from the US. Um, any thoughts about you know, whether there, even within this kind of contained space, how can you know, sort of soft diplomacy, uh, academic cultural exchange, uh, any sense uh, that there is a change from, from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. Does anyone want to take a stab at that question? I thank you for the question. I can just quickly say two things that the Biden administration is doing that's positive. One is rolling out the vaccines very, very fast, very effective. I think that will show the Chinese don't be so afraid. I mean, that's related to the travel ban. I think uh, from the Chinese side, they are really afraid of uh, new cases coming in. So I think the vaccination rollout in the US is doing well. Of course, more needs to be done. Secondly, given the recent anti-Asian uh, rise in the anti-Asian hate and assaults, it's a tragic thing that's happened, but I think it awakened people and the Biden administration has acted quickly and will do more. I think that's also moving in a good direction. Thanks. Ben talks about the uh, sort of reciprocal kind of tit for tat sanction. And this is something I was thinking about it, uh, that, you know, even the pandemic made this kind of a reciprocal or tit for tat, you know, kind of a posture that much more often and that much more even you know between EU and China too you know EU was ready to open because EU opened uh, uh, travel last fall to South South Korea where you know pandemic situation is relatively you know about the same as China even China in, in a way in some ways is better but not China because on the ground of China did not will not you know in short term reciprocally, do the same thing. So it now makes this kind of an entanglement that much harder that US, for example, could have opened China, you know, a while back. Yet, as Chin said, that, that you know, because China 
itself now worry about the imported uh, infections and as long as China, United States in, in situation or uh, pandemics not you know getting better or you know and not at least they perceive not that that better then then uh, then they would not so that would uh, makes this kind of travel ban that much of a harder to disentangle because that reciprocal kind of become more and more like a practice. Can, you, can I just yeah, for a second? Ahead. Let me just say on the, so Eugene, I think you raised extremely in, important issues and, and um, on the sort of US targeting of, of uh, Chinese scientists, you know, suspicion of, of folks who have ties to China, uh, you know, my hope is that the Justice Department, now under professional leadership, will take a more sensible approach. Um, although I, I think it's important to recognize that concern, concerns in the national security establishment about China run very deep. So I don't, I don't think we know yet enough to, you know, I don't think the FBI's China initiative was helpful. I think it, it was way over encompassing. Um, I think, you know, so the hope is we can get a little more nuanced approach. Um, I also want to say that, that you know, part of the problem I think we had, um, and we have a system of sort of politicized U.S. attorneys, and it's clearly some of them uh, were, were using their positions as U.S. attorneys to do some high-profile prosecutions and prosecuting first and thinking later. I think in some cases, but but I think so. I think it's I think we're going to see a smarter approach, although I don't think it's going to go away. And I think there really are very deep concerns, um, and so you know the the I think it remains to be seen exactly how this plays out, but. But some of the rhetoric maybe will change. And I think the changes of the rhetoric at the top make a difference, right? What we're seeing now is, is I mean, obviously there's nothing, unfortunately, right? Institutionalized anti-Asian racism runs very deep in the United States, uh, almost as deep as this country. Much of this backed up by the force of law over the, much of our history. And it's a very you know, shameful history for the United States. Uh, the, the, so what we're seeing now, you know, I think is, is reflects that history, but also reflects the really explicit racism we saw coming out of the Trump administration. And I do think that different messaging at the top, um, you know, will over time have, have a difference. Although we're obviously really always paying the price uh, for what's gone on over the last four years, but also what's been going on over the last 200 years, um, you know, in, in recent attacks uh, here in New York and elsewhere. Thank you. Eugenia. Uh, um, yes, Andy, go ahead. I, I think uh, that, uh, educational cooperation and so forth is very important, but I don't want to leave the impression that these issues are easy to resolve. The, <coughs> the technical competition for the leading technologies of the 21st century economy is real. Chinese acquisition of technology from the United States and Europe through methods that are legal and some that are illegal is a real problem. The universities are a place where that some of that technology gets developed. And so without, I, I agree with Ben that uh, it has to be handled, uh, you know, professionally, but it has to be handled. And then I think another issue that is difficult is Chinese attempts to influence scholarship. Uh, we must preserve academic freedom on our campuses if this educational exchange is to be, have any value. So I'm all in favor of it, but uh, the problems that are inherent in it are also there. Uh, my next question um, shifts us to the issue uh, that came up uh, with Tom's initial comments, but was a recurrent theme in many of your comments, which is the focus um, that the Biden administration now is shifting towards that, that the Trump administration did not pursue, but basically this, this focus on uh, alliance using our uh, sort of ability to ally with other partners in the world in order to uh, sometimes contain, uh, sometimes uh, enable cooperation, sometimes to manage the competition with China. Um, and ideally, uh, hopefully with an eye towards reducing the tensions, even recognizing the realities of, you know, a rising, a rising <laughs> China and, and a declining US, right? The US empire, as Andy put it, is, is one of the reasons why there is this sense of threat. Um, so, but I wanted to ask um, you all, um, perhaps Andy and Tom, but others as well, um, you know, the US uh, under Trump had also uh, really sacrificed its relationships with its allies. Um, so uh, what sense do you have? I mean, we have to mend bridges <laughs> and mend fences with a lot of people. Um, so if uh, the US re-enters a lot of these uh, pre-existing 
uh, sort of multi-alliance uh, kind of organizations, uh, will we do so as in a position of strength that we once had? Um, if not, will the Biden administration be willing to kind of be more co-equals with uh, other allies, whether in Asia or in the US? Uh, any thoughts on this matter? Tom, why don't you go ahead? Okay, uh, thanks, Eugenia. Uh, you know, I think it's pretty easy to improve U.S. relations with allies around the world and partners. There's a lot of partners. Uh, by most measures, the United States has 60 plus allies and partners around the world. China really has very few. Uh, uh, North Korea being one formal one, maybe Pakistan, um, and a, a few rogue states uh, around the world. And then some people think Russia. I don't think the Russia-China relationship is really an alliance, but it is a close relationship. Um, so the U.S. has an enormous advantage in that realm. Uh, the Trump administration did a lot of uh, damage to the U.S. alliance system by uh, putting trade pressure on allies like uh, South Korea and Japan and on the EU states, um, and also very publicly calling them out for not burden sharing enough, you know, sharing the burden enough in the alliance. So that should be relatively easy to fix, but I think a lot of American allies and partners can't really unsee the Trump administration phenomenon. Um, so I think it's gonna be hard to build deep uh, trust for the US uh, commitment to allies in a hurry. Uh, and they have to worry about 2024. Um, you know, what, you know who, will, will uh, uh, another Trump administration equivalent come into power then? So I think some damage has been done, but I think it's a easy thing to improve, not an easy thing to fully restore um, and then the multilateral organizations, um, the Trump administration, you know, pulled out of lots of them, did tremendous damage to the WTO. I mean, the U.S. is a much bigger violator of the WTO than China is uh, at present um, with the uh, with the, uh, the the trade war. Um, and also uh, the, the Trump administration went after the uh, adjudicating judges uh, in the WTO system. Uh, preventing them from being hired so that you couldn't even, the WTO became somewhat paralyzed. So going back into those organizations should be uh, relatively easy. Um, going into discussions on climate change should be relatively easy. But again, I think the US lost a lot of credibility by pulling out of all of these things. Um, and I think Iran is gonna be very, very difficult. And I really don't like it when uh, Iranian diplomats look sensible compared to the American position, but their argument that the U.S. pulled out of the deal unilaterally and should return to it unilaterally uh, is going to find a lot of followers around the world, particularly in Beijing. So it's going to be very difficult for the U.S. to get leverage on Iran uh, since the U.S. unilaterally pulled out of a deal that a previous administration made. Um, and one of the uh, one of the alums has asked a question about. Uh, whether the focus on domestic politics in the United States will pre prevent the United States from engaging China in a serious way. And I think if you mean big meetings between US and China, uh, the strategic and economic dialogue type meetings uh, that happened in previous administrations, I would say yes. But there are pressing issues out there that really matter to the United States and to its allies, like climate change and like nuclear proliferation that will not allow the United States to avoid dealing with China. Um, the world is still there. The world creates pressing matters that we have to deal with Beijing on. And those are already happening uh, on Iran. Uh, and I think they'll happen with climate change. Um, and it's just the reality of the international system that countries can't in a globalized system can't afford to just pull into themselves and say, well, you know, we're just gonna concentrate on our, on our own issues. Tom has an important article that says a lot about this question of American relations with its allies on China policy. And is it the next issue of Foreign Affairs, Tom? Or no, it's out. It's the online edition. So it's March 24th. It's out. Um, and I make an argument that uh, our allies are our greatest strength, but our allies don't want a Cold War with China. So, yeah. And uh, so one of the important points that Tom makes in this article that he hasn't made in his brief presentation here is that none of our allies' interests align 100% with our interests. The European allies' interest in China is predominantly commercial. They don't have a major security commitment in the, uh, in the you know, Western Pacific, South China Sea. They have some. 
South Korea and Japan don't want, uh, you know, don't want a Cold War with China because China's too close, too big, too dangerous, too important. India doesn't want to align itself with the United States completely. It wants a little cooperation and not too much. Even Taiwan, you know, is, you know, depends entirely on the United States, but doesn't want the United States to sort of pull down the house around the ears of Taiwan. And so the if you're going to cooperate with the allies, and I think this is the main point in Tom's paper, that constitutes a kind of constraint on what US China policy can be a, probably a, a, a beneficial constraint. Yeah, you might call it adult supervision, Andy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you both. Um, one final question before we, tur we tur uh, turn on the live Q&A or move to the live Q&A. Um, I wanted to um, ask a little bit about uh, the China side of affairs. Xiaobua was uh, uh, shared with us very helpful um, uh, charts and graphs, giving us a sense of, uh, you know, some of the sensibility of the Chinese citizens um, in terms of where Ch they see themselves um, in um, the world today. Um, uh, but I wanted to get a more, a sort of more forensic uh, analysis in so far as trying to understand, a, uh, you know, I mean, the Chinese population obviously knows that Biden is not the same as Trump and that the new administration is coming in. Um, and, uh, you know, do we have a sense, does this panel have a sense of whether the Chinese, you know, internal discussion uh, is acknowledging and recognizing that shift and has a, a pulse uh, uh, on the U.S. Um, domestic, uh, uh, well, both governmental policy and Biden's approach versus also, as well as the kind of domestic um, uh, popular sentiment in the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, and also, do we have any sense that uh, Xi Jinping's policies are shifting uh, in response to uh, the new Biden administration? What kind of footing? I mean, obviously, the Anchorage one suggests continuity, but I was wondering if we could get kind of uh, a more subtle analysis, perhaps, or, or any observations on, on this front. Um, um, and any thoughts? Maybe Chin and Xiaobo might start us off. Let me just look at the, uh, try to answer the first question. I don't know what Xi Jinping's policy and so on, but at the, again, at the people's level, how the sort of Chinese, you know, sentiment, I think, is evolved and changed over the last uh, four or five years. Um, I think in part, one of the big damages, if you will, that, uh, you know, the Trump administration in terms of this U.S.-China relations is this is this kind of the how Chinese view the United States. I think Biden is completely right that, again, you know, overall, not just the US-China relations, but overall, the, the damage that's done by previous administration is that the kind of a trust, the kind of a you know, democracy as it is understood by the Chinese, or at least some of the aspirations among the some Chinese, um, you know, younger generation, middle-aged people who were, you know, who come of age in the, you know, 1980s, 90s, now looking at uh, United States in a, in a very different, you know, kind of a, a, a used different lenses, different kind of a, because in part because the disinformation, you know, I have to say that with the internet, with the, um, you know, uh, the irony is that, uh, you know, Trump administration tried to ban WeChat, but WeChat actually is the one I see that among all the social media, spread the most disin you know, disinformation about United States, really, for better or worse, because a lot of those disinformation people, a different generation, because older Chinese also use WeChat, mm -hmm. right? I mean, then say Weibo and others. Uh, and so they actually got all the information and they believe those information and they actually sometimes to forward to those of us living in the world and say, oh, this is true. So they got a lot of that. And that's irony because the, you know, social media became a venue like elsewhere in the world, but China too, is that the disinformation, the image of the United States has been damaged and you know, you know, along with it is democracy. So that's why a lot of Chinese now feel more self-confident. You know, even after the pandemic, they feel, see, the Chinese way is better. Again, you know, that's how I think that that is the subtle but significant change 
among the Chinese public opinion regarding this uh, you know, United States and US-China relations. I think that is maybe add to that pessimistic view of Andy and others have, it's in the long term, that one is hard, very difficult to, 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 to change, to reverse. Thank you. I would just add, um, as Andy mentioned, one of the foci of the Biden administration has been to rebuild the US. I think that's really a great uh, new focus. Um, it's not that foreign relations, international relations are not important, but some agenda items can be pursued quietly. But uh, in the Chinese people's eyes, the US has been in decline, both in rhetoric and in uh, the economy, in human relations, uh, in fighting between, I mean, racism, all these attacks. That's very disheartening to, to the American people, but to the world. So the Chinese people could uh, just be shocked and laugh at the US uh, and worry about their relatives and friends in the US, uh, including all of us. So I think for the Chinese people, what they have enjoyed in the past decades is a rebuilding of their country, poverty eradication. Now they've shifted to revitalize the countryside Again, huge investments and expansion in social welfare policies to the most impoverished. Uh, one of our current research projects is to look at how the Chinese government at the central and local levels to bring clean water to every corner of the country. I mean, that's amazing for the Chinese people. So I think uh, uh, if they see a shift in this focus in the US, I think that's uh, comforting and that's a good direction for everyone so that there could be more dialogue. Uh, right now, I, I think the Biden administration is moving in that direction and it's very good for both the American and Chinese people. But uh, I think that uh, could be emphasized more and pursued more. And I think that would do Biden well in the upcoming elections. Thank you, Chin. Yeah, no, your point about kind of the overlap uh, in terms of their approaches toward infrastructure, I thought was a very interesting one um, and coincides with what many other panelists have also discussed in terms of these opportunities of collaboration, such as climate change. Um, but we should add to those, you know, issues, uh, the, the infrastructure issue too. Um, let's move to the live Q&A and I will just call some uh, questions, some overlap. Um, and I will pose them for the panelists. Uh, some maybe, uh, in, you know, I think we can have one or two panelists address them. I might identify some that uh, uh, speak more to, you know, a particular panelist's expertise, um, or else I might keep it open and see who might be interested in speaking. So one uh, question uh, that came in from uh, the alumni, uh, um, Martin Leung writes, what can we expect the US strategy to be with Taiwan, Hong Kong and Hong Kong? And how big of an effect will this be on US-China relations? Would there be anyone, may, uh, Tom, maybe I'll, I'll have you start off with that. Yeah. This yeah. is my uh, area of responsibility yeah. at the State Department. Yes. So I guess I have to give an answer. I, I, you know, it, it's, difficult to predict how it will play out over time with the Biden administration because it's so new, but they seem to be continuing with their uh, desire to upgrade various contacts with Taiwan in a way that is uh, upsetting to the mainland. Uh, recently, a U.S. ambassador to Palau accompanied the Palau's president to visit Taiwan. That would be unprecedented uh, uh, in the uh, post-1979 era in my, in my recollection. Uh, I don't know whether that was thought through, uh, whether that was strategic, um, but those types of contacts are uh, a source of aggravation to the mainland and that affects US-China relations. Um, I expect a strong commitment from the people I described before, like Dan Crittenbrink or Rosenberger, Kirk Campbell um, for Taiwan security. Um, and I agree with Andy that this is going to be probably the main point of tension between the United States and China in the security realm. Um, but I think it's very different from Hong Kong. And I think uh, the United States has a lot of options with Taiwan. It doesn't have a lot of options with Hong Kong. And I think what you've seen with the Biden administration is a continuation of previous policy, which is a basic recognition that Hong Kong is no longer what it used to be. 
uh, because of the national security law and the interference of the mainland in Hong Kong domestic poli uh, 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 politics and government, um, Hong Kong is no longer autonomous from the mainland. So it will be treated as non-autonomous in US foreign policy. Hong Kong was treated differently in trade, economics, uh, visas, all sorts of things from the mainland in the past because it was autonomous. Now it's not considered autonomous, I think that's justified. And that's pretty much the extent of it. You have these sanctions on individual uh, officials who deal with Hong Kong. I, I think that's kind of feckless. I agree with Ben on this. We're dealing with a Leninist system. It's very hierarchical. The idea that you would sanction an individual colonel, uh, general, one-star general in a system like that because of the policies suggests that those individuals have some leeway for decision. And I don't really think they do. I don't think the people, the policies on Hong Kong out of Beijing um, are determined by uh, some foreign ministry person who happens to be seconded to uh, Beijing's representative office in Hong Kong at any given time, or some state council official. Um, those are made at a very high level. So I don't see the point in sanctioning the individuals. And I think it's very destructive that China has uh, reciprocated, particularly in the EU sanctions against think tanks and other things. Um, so I, I don't see much progress on Hong Kong. I find it very depressing. Um, and I don't think that US policy will really change from what it is now and what it was last year, uh, which is to treat Hong Kong as basically part of the PRC from here on out. Okay, hey, thanks, Tom. Um, we have we have uh, several other questions, so maybe what I'll do is uh, move on to another question here. Um, right here, I have one question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and perhaps this one might be directed towards Andy. Recently, Beijing released a report of US violations of human rights and emphasized the strategy of telling bad US stories to its domestic and international audience. How will negative reports and mutual distrust in the public realm influence both countries' public opinions and in turn influence US-China public strategies? As you know, the Congress many years ago, decades ago, passed a law that required the Department of State of the U.S. to issue an annual report on human rights in other countries. And so China's included in that and other, other U.S. government agencies like the Congressional Executive Commission on China also issue reports on Chinese human rights. And the reports published by the United States about Chinese human rights are, are very accurate. And China has responded by, and this isn't the first time, by publishing reports on human rights problems in the United States that are also very accurate. There is a lot of bad stuff to be said about human rights in the United States, different issues from the Chinese issues, but bad issues, especially around racism and poverty. So it's a tit for tat. I mean, one optimistic take on this is that the Chinese seem to be affirming the, the validity of human rights discourse among states, which in fact is legal under international human rights law, but that's not really, and, and they seem to trust US media because their sourcing is entirely to US media. But you know, that's not really the point. The point is uh, you spit in my eye, I'll spit in your eye. On the questioner's question about the impact of these things on public opinion I, in either country, I think not much. I think this is a little game of the diplomats and I don't think the general public pays a huge amount of attention to the reports. Um, I don't think, for example, that Chinese people's, I, I would defer to Xiaobo, but I don't think that Chinese people's image of the United States is quite depending on what the Chinese foreign ministry report says. And in the United States, I think, although there's, as Xiaobo pointed out, a lot of hostility to China on human rights issues, it's not coming from the State Department, it's from the media, it's from the politicians and so forth. So the reports themselves probably are not a big factor. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that this is mostly it's coming from the kind of the the coverage, in fact, you, one could see in the last few years, the coverage of United States or the Western countries, the kind of a official media's tone has changed, evolved into much more 
picking. All right, if you talk about human rights, let's talk about you know uh, Black Lives Matters and you know racial and poverty and all that. Indeed, that's the kind of the, the highlights. You know, it's all I will say. It's not necessarily fake news, but it's a selective reporting. Right, a selective reporting, which exists in all countries, but the Chinese official media, obviously, that that's kind of that's where the the kind of image of the public opinion is being formed. I think that is a crucial, crucial, you know, source of uh, of the you know information that that uh, people in in China sort of uh, you know get that uh, what's going on in the United States. If I may add here, in my view, I think the Chinese uh, government released reports have a bigger influence on Chinese people's views toward the US than the US government release of the reports. I don't think in the US, a lot of people pay attention to it or read it at all. I mean, uh, the public opinion, as Xiaobo said, is more influenced by uh, the media. But in China, the foreign ministry and those public uh, uh, events where they share the reports do influence people a lot. Um, I, I worry a bit about that. If that's the uh, uh, rhetoric that's being highlighted, even though it's true, it could influence public opinion and indirectly the relations between the two countries. Thank you. Um, this, I'm actually bundling two questions and perhaps I will actually ask Ben to start us off with uh, addressing these two questions. Um, they're both related to university, um, uh, sort of the educational world um, and uh, um, how it's entangled in US-China relations. So one, Alfred Tsai writes, how do you view American antagonism towards the political agenda of Confucius Institutes in the United States? Uh, and then the other one was, oh, I think I might have just lost it. It was regarding um, the issue of um, Fulbright. Um, yes, I got it. I remember. I read it. Okay, okay. you remember it? Okay, so, so sorry. I, I'm losing yeah. it. I so, so let me start with the second one first. Um, you know, I think folks on the call will know that the Trump administration ended Fulbright's for China. I think this is terrible um, and certainly hope that Fulbright's will be reinstated uh, under the Biden administration, right? I mean, especially at this moment uh, when it's becoming harder for folks to travel and, and US-China relations are deteriorating. We need more knowledge about China. So I think um, you know, we should have Fulbright's back in China. It's absolutely vital for our own national security, for our own understanding of, of, of China. Um, and uh, I think it's good to have Americans teaching in China as well. Um, uh, you know, there's research, there's, there's teaching. So uh, now I don't know whether China's gonna let the Fulbright's back in. That's another question actually, um, given the change, I think that that might prove to be a bigger obstacle uh, than, uh, than the termination. On the first side, I just think the, the days of Confucius Institutes are, are rapidly ending. And, uh, you know, I, I actually, so I, I just think this is probably gonna be something that we see in the rear view mirror. It's, it's many, many universities have closed their Confucius Institutes. My guess is ones that haven't will be doing it soon. Um, and, uh, you know, I, at some level, I mean, I think this, this, you know, reflects geopolitical changes, but I also think it re reflects the way they were run. Um, you know, uh, I, if the if the record over the last 15 or 20 years had been of zero interference and total openness to debate, maybe the situation would be different, but there's a, enough evidence from around the world that that hasn't been the case. But I just think that this is rapidly, uh, you know, I, I personally think we should be encouraged, we should spend, be spending US government money to, to fund language programs. I mean, we should be, we sh our response to the Confucian Institute's should not be to shut down language programs, it should be to fund language programs. And so, um, you know, my hope going forward is that we can see reinvestment in, in study of Chinese. Um, it, it's in our own interest to do that, but I do not think we're gonna, say, I think the days of Confucian suits on American campuses are, are rapidly approaching their end. Uh, but I, I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that. We're uh, speaking of rapidly coming to an end, I think uh -huh. our session is rapidly coming to an end. I think I have one more, I have time for one more quick question. And so anyone can feel free to jump in uh, and, and share their brief thoughts on this. Um, so one question was, how will Biden's policies shift if he lose 2022 midterm elections or if he wins? Any thoughts on this? 
it's a tough question. <laughs> it's asking I, you all I, to look into the future. <laughs> I think I think uh, Qin Gao has the it has the the lead on this because the thing it'll affect the most is uh, things like domestic infrastructure projects uh, on China policy. There's a pretty broad bipartisan consensus for a tough p posture towards China. So even if he holds on to a slim majority in the, on Capitol Hill, I don't think that that's going to have a huge impact on China policy versus having a, uh, the Republicans having a, a slight majority. But on things that, that involve large amounts of spending, uh, domestic spending, I think it'll have an enormous impact. So I'll, t I'll just defer to Chin what she thinks about the infrastructure programs in a situation in which the Democrats don't have a majority. That's tough. I hope uh, the Democrats come to their senses in supporting this. Uh, but I agree, Biden is correct to focus on rebuilding the US, including spending, investing in children, education, technology. Um, maybe some of that requires a different narrative. So call it infrastructure, call it something else. But uh, I, I hope uh, he would uh, retain the majority so that a lot more can be done. I mean, to turn the US back to this very positive path requires a lot, including the legislative power. Um, so, so I'm only hoping it could get there. And I hope the people give the politicians enough pressure for them to do the right thing. Thank you all. I think our time is coming to an end. I want to thank uh, my esteemed colleagues for their insights, um, very important insights during a tense moment. Uh, hopefully it's a pivotal moment. We are all, uh, as um, again, Andy mentioned, guardedly pessimistic. I hope we can eventually turn to being guardedly optimistic. Uh, and I also wanted to thank uh, all the attendees for joining us in this important conversation. Uh, and again, to the uh, CAA uh, Global Clubs uh, for organizing a fascinating and compelling uh, webinar. Thank you all. Thanks, Eugenia. Bye-bye. Thank you.